Hi, welcome to the MPI workshop presented by the NSS Exceed program. This was originally a two-day event with hands-on exercises that you can view at your own pace. It's very important to understand that there are some tools that, although I didn't want to distract us from doing these exercises with, because there's just there's already a lot to learn, and you want to know that you're learning MPI, not a bunch of the environment, but it'd be crazy for you not to know that there are tools that make a lot of this stuff that we've been doing already in these simple exercises even simpler. In particular, debuggers and profilers. These are the two classes of tools I think are underappreciated in programming in general of any sort. Uh, people really just don't exploit uh, the ability for, for debuggers and profilers to give you a huge, very friendly, low effort uh, jump on your code. And so we'll just quickly look at these. In particular, debuggers. Now, the good news is that buggers, as I'll show you, are incredibly friendly, GUI-based, intuitive things to use uh, that you can throw out your code almost immediately. The bad news in parallel programming is that there are really only a couple of good debuggers, and they are both proprietary licensed products, and they're not cheap either. Licenses are not cheap. Now, the more good news is that uh, organizations like Exceed own the licenses and make these things available to you. So uh, you, you have access to them. Everybody here today has access to these tools via Exceed at the very least, if not campus licenses or whatever. They are not open source though, so you're not just going to go and grab a copy and throw it on your laptop. But you absolutely would be silly to do serious development without uh, using these because they're, they just make the issues of parallel debugging so much easier. Very simple to compile with. You just basically use the dash G option Actually, remarkably, that's not even always necessary, but you compile with just dash G. Now you've got the symbolic information you need in there uh, to fire up one of these debuggers. Um, a recent development that's very nice is that these debuggers now have clients that are local, so you can skip the whole X Windows complication uh, for reasons that, that baffle me continually. You know, X Windows applications get slower every year. Uh, instead of faster. So if you're afraid of a, a window that to use the GUI, you've got to do an X server, you know, and it's going to be incredibly laggy, intolerably so at times. I can't blame you because that is that is my experience with many X Windows tools. It's worse than it was a long time ago. But we don't have to worry about that with these. They have clients, so you can download the desktop client. It's the unlicensed piece. They're nice. The companies say, okay, the licensed part that lives on the machine that you're debugging on, the supercomputer or whatnot but we'll give you a client you can throw on your laptop and they're very snappy, they're, very, uh, they're, they're not laggy at all. And so download the client on your laptop and then you're staring at an interface that looks like this. If you've used the buggers at all for serial programming, and I wish I could take it for granted that all of you have because it's crazy not to use the buggers when you're doing uh, uh, serial programming too. Uh, so if you have, this looks familiar. If you haven't, fear not. These interfaces are very friendly uh, and, and, and simple. Your source code pops up right here. And now we can do things like set breakpoints in the code where we want the code to pause so we can examine variables and, and all kinds of things in our code. Uh, this <coughs> is, uh, for example, right here. I had, this is our Laplace code. We're looking at our Laplace code, and I wanted to see how it was behaving at some point in time. So I set a conditional breakpoint here. I can even set breakpoints based upon the value of some variable. I can say stop when x equals 2 or something. In this case here, I said stop on iteration. Yeah, I can't quite see that font there, probably 3,000 or something. So I can set a conditional breakpoint here and say stop at some point in the code. Uh, and it'll, uh, it'll stop, you know, at, uh, not just on a line, but on some conditions. And you can make complex conditions. These are all wonderful things. What makes this a parallel debugger? So these, again, if you're a debugger person, this all looks very familiar. What makes it a parallel debugger is that we're capable of dealing with different PEs right here. So I am looking at, as we know as MPI programmers right now, there's no such thing as being on this line for an MPI program. Each PE could be on a different line of this code. At the moment, we're looking at PE0. So PE0 is on this line of this code I've set a breakpoint for. I can go look at the other PEs. They might be somewhere else in this code, and their variables will most likely have other values. So I can move around and navigate between the PEs very easily. If you think that uh, we're only limited, it's nice we've got four buttons up here. We're only limited to you know, working with a couple dozen PEs or something. That's not the case at all. These debuggers, DDT and TotalView, uh, are, are meant to work with serious scalable runs of thousands or tens of thousands of PEs easily. And so the interface has options. If we were working on 10,000 PEs, we can, we can navigate between them as well. So what happens with four PEs, we'll just click back and forth between these buttons right here. 
Uh, we can do things like find uh, anomalies, you know, where is one variable different than another amongst all the PEs. Again, these are meant to work with very large scalable codes, so it can do things like find out where one variable that's goofy amongst all of our hundreds of PEs, where is that variable, and we can find things. It has some nice real-time visualization, well, almost real-time visualization capabilities built into it. This is what I used to generate this graphic we looked at earlier, where I paused the code at step 3000, so this is the temperature at 3000 steps, and it did a job of recombining all of my PEs into one data structure. As, as we said, the data structure uh, temperature or temperature last no longer really exists anywhere. It's, it's only in our minds. Well, this uh, debuggers like this can kind of reconstruct. These are the four different PEs that contribute to temperature. And it, it actually you know, accommodates their layout and puts them back together. So here's our, our 1,000 by 1,000 grid distributed over these four PEs. These are the values of it. Uh, it's very easy to manipulate our data and investigate it like this uh, and, and find the debug problem. So these, these are wonderful things to have. Uh, and they're available to you again on bridges. For example, we have uh, DDT. Uh, on other Exceed platforms, there are other uh, DDT or Total View typically available on most of them, uh, and you, you'd be crazy not to take advantage of them. And there are you know, a lot of academic uh, licensed versions of this as well out there. Uh, profile, oh, well, these are some other fields I mentioned. This. It works very well with large numbers of PEs, as I said, even though you, know, you might think it's unmanageable to debug 20,000 PEs to find out which one's causing you some weird problem. You can do that. You can coalesce them together into groups and everything else. You can connect to running jobs. So if you're working with a code where the problem happens eight hours into a run on 10,000 PEs, which does happen, you can, you can manage that. You can actually connect to that job part with your run. Also, these, these work good with hybrid codes as well. So if you've got some OpenMP, uh, well, standalone OpenMP code, for example, they're great with, but if you have a hybrid code with their mixed and match, that works with those as well. Also deals with memory debugging, memory problems happen in, in MPI codes, just like doing regular codes. And they can trace the messages bouncing back and forth as well. Uh, I have some couple of graphs of, of this kind of stuff right here. This can be really nice. So here's an example of uh, a communication pattern. Here's a nearest neighbor communication pattern in 3D. We've done our Laplace code, nearest neighbor communication. Nearest neighbor is a common enough thing to do in any domain decomposition. You're communicating with your, your, your neighbors that are nearby. Uh, here's an example of a big 3D uh, problem that was broken up in the nearest neighbor communication between all the PEs. I think this was running on 16,000 PEs here. So 16,000 PEs, and we can still see how our neighbors are communicating nearest neighbor. You can click on any one of them and find out things like traffic and how many messages are sent. So it's a, it's a really good, quick way to see what's going on in your code. Here's a breakdown of where time is spent in this particular application. This one, this is a profiler here, as a matter of fact. This is not a debugger, this is a profiler here in this case. It is open source, so we do have a really good options uh, open source for uh, profilers, in particular Tau. Tau is fantastic uh, and can give us some very sophisticated insights into where our code is spending time. So here is a breakdown of, uh, uh, of where the time is spent on different PEs. And you can start to see patterns emerge and where you maybe haven't distributed things properly because certain PEs are spending more time than others doing various things. You can see this application, an awful lot of the time is spent in NPI communication calls. And here, here are other breakdowns of the message passing and things, and, and this is all really, really uh, important when you're trying to optimize your code. And you can stick in lots of timers in various places and just stare at your code, or you can throw a profiler at the code and get a quick breakdown. And in particular, when somebody's handing you an existing code of somebody else's, this is a, a good way to get an entry point into the code and figure out where at least you can focus, where you should focus, in order to, to have any effect. Uh, Kathy, uh, run the uh, debugger on the cluster or like on bridges? Like is there a way to do that? Absolutely. There, yes, absolutely. I encourage you to do so. Give it a shot. Uh, so I will point you at the user guide. So if you go to psc.edu, you'll find the Bridges user guide there. If you look in the user guide, it has the very straightforward instructions to, to pull up the debugger. And, uh, and I would recommend the client mode where you spend a minute and download, like I say, the local client instead of using the X window mode. 
uh, it, it's just the X Windows versions are are definitely laggier. So take a minute and download the client. But at any rate, the instructions for that are available on the the Bridges user guide. Uh, it should take just a second to 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 compile your code. Use dash dash G. You load the module total view. I mean, these are basically instructions right here. Compile with dash G. Module load uh, DDT, not total view. We have the DDT debugger on Bridges. DDT, and then uh, uh, fire it up, and and you've got this in front of you. So I would. I would encourage all of you to play around with the Laplace code and, and get an idea of what this tool can do. Uh, we also have, although the Intel stuff is also licensed, uh, we have it on Bridges as well, and you are free to use it. Uh, all this stuff is bundled together. Intel calls this the Parallel Studio. They have umpteen different versions of it. Uh, I think it's Parallel Studio XE has all these tools here. Uh, and they are also very, uh, very friendly. Uh, they're actually, they're friendly any one of the tools. The hardest part with the Intel Studio is figuring out which tool to use because they have like a half a dozen different tools. They overlap an awful lot in what they do. So that's confusing. If you're a little bit confused by which tool should I use for what, I can't blame you. I am half the time too because there's so much overlap. But at the end of the day, the capabilities are, are all there in the various tools to do some really nice stuff. So I've used it in this case here to capture some message passing patterns in a very complex code. Uh, the message passing patterns in this code are, are really crazy. It does a bunch of all-to-all -all operations, uh, uh, and yet we wanted to figure out where the time was spent, and it did a pretty good job of capturing some, some patterns there. Uh, you can do performance analysis, like a roofline analysis, if you're familiar with any of these kind of things. Uh, it can be captured really easily. Uh, you can find out where your time is spent, and uh, it's, it's just they're very, very nice tools to get a handle again on a code that somebody's handing you, on your own code as you're developing and playing with it to find out where you really need to spend some time or where there's some performance surprises that you may not be aware of. So you're crazy not to use these tools. I find it sometimes uh, insane that people will spend six months writing a code. Uh, they'll, I'll get involved with you know, maybe helping them optimize the code or whatever, and you know, they'll say, okay, well, what's your profiler showing you on this? Well, I haven't had time to, to get involved with the profile. It's like, well, this is you know, it's half an hour. In half an hour, we could have it. You spend six months writing the code, and you haven't had, found half an hour to fire a profiler up and find out what your code's actually up to. But that's a common enough case. There's just an inertia to diverting your attention, I guess, and, and learning a new tool. But the learning curves for these are, are pretty shallow because they're just GUIs. You click around and discover the things that, that they'll throw at you, the graphs and whatnot. So you should. Uh, and it's not a bad idea at all to, to use a Laplace code with a debugger to get an idea of what it's about. Again, it's a very, very intuitive, friendly interface. Uh, so that, that's all I want to say. Uh, I've, I've slightly violated my role here with everything we've done so far in the workshop has been you know, open source, standards based, and everything. So I'm always a little uncomfortable when I start showing things that are licensed software or whatever, but it's crazy not to, to be aware of their existence. And again, the fact that Exceed or maybe your local institution uh, have licenses for these I mean, it's not that improbable that you have access to these. And, and again, I want to emphasize Tau is completely open source, readily available, and you can download and throw it at you know, your laptop very, very easily.